So I've made a few videos about weathery things like rainbows and clouds and things, but one thing we haven't really talked about, which clearly has a lot of physics behind it, is thunderstorms, lightning and thunder. And so I thought I'd talk a little bit about that. Professor, you're the 60 symbols weatherman. <laughs> I need a map to stand in front of, don't I really? The forecast for this particular video is it's quite complicated. So usually when I kind of think, it'd be nice to do a video about something, I kind of, you know, I know a bit about it and then I'll go and read up a bit more about it. This is one of those cases where you keep coming across where things where people say, and we really don't know X or we can't understand Y. It turns out even today there are significant gaps in our knowledge about how thunderstorms work. I mean, we'll talk a little bit about what we don't know, but there are some bits that we do know. So I'll sort of sketch out what we do know. Probably not all of it, but some of the bits and pieces of the, what the underlying physics is. So let's start with, with this, Feynman Lectures on Physics classic textbook um, and in fact it was my first interest in in the physics of thunderstorms it actually came from reading this many many years ago where did you get this book ah so this was a prize <laughs> there are three of them yeah there are three volumes and in volume one you can see where i got it from i could have put them in different books but i decided to get one expensive book the Feynman lecture notes and actually so one's a prize for physics and the other is a prize for maths so each of which sort of came with a, a, a cheap book and I decided to combine them to buy something a bit more expensive. One of the long sections of the books is about electromagnetism, electricity and magnetism and there's a sort of section within that where Feynman talks about thunderstorms and which is why I sort of first got interested in thunderstorms. It's a sort of a good place to start although so bear in mind this was the 1960s when this was written and there are various entertaining bits about there which kind of reveal the level of ignorance at the time which actually, for a, in large part, hasn't been fixed since. So let me read just this bit of the book. So it's all about electric charges, because we're going to be talking about electrostatics. So he talks about this and he says that the top of the thunderstorm has a positive charge and the bottom a negative one, except for a small local region of positive charge at the bottom of the cloud, which has caused everyone a lot of worry. No one seems to know why it's there, how it is important, whether it's a secondary effect of the positive rain coming down or whether it is an essential part of the machinery. Things would be much simpler if it weren't there. So it, it's kind of a slightly complicated picture, but the basics are kind of fairly straightforward, which is that a lightning strike is really just an electric discharge. To get that, you need a big voltage difference, which essentially means you need a bunch of positive charges here and a bunch of negative charges here. And then the things sort of fairly catastrophically re-equalize and the charges all balance out by a, a spark of electricity, essentially a current flying from one to the other to make the thing all equalize out. And indeed, as Feynman just said in that little bit of his book, you've got this picture where you've got the classic kind of anvil shaped thundercloud where positive charges end up at the, at the top and negative charges end up at the bottom and then there's this inconvenient little bit of positive charge at the bottom. So we have to come up with a mechanism for separating out the charge. And it turns out that the mechanism that thunderclouds use is actually one that we use in the lab as well. And so we can kind of introduce it by talking about how we create charge separation in the lab. And the sort of the classic way of doing that is a thing called a Van de Graaff generator. a uh, device that a guy called Van de Graaff came up with in the 1930s, actually. It was more recent than I thought it was, 1930s. He was interested in smashing things together at very high energy, and so wanted to accelerate particles. And so the way he did that, if it's a charged particle, if you've got a, a big voltage, then you can accelerate the charged particle um, and use it for uh, smashing into nuclei, smashing into atoms, and so on. So he was really interested in ways of accelerating particles. We now have different ways of doing that. So the Van de Graaff generator has really kind of become a, a, almost a teaching device these days rather than something which is used in cutting edge physics. But most physics labs around the world will have a, phys a, a Van de Graaff generator in it somewhere. So there was a time when this was like an important piece of actual science kit. It really was. In the 1930s, it was the state-of-the-art way of producing large voltages to allow you to accelerate things. And they made some huge Van de Graaff generators. There are some truly spectacular examples. One thing that people, most people will know about physics is, a, is about static electricity, that if you rub two materials together, you can actually create a static charge. And it's the way, you know, if you have got a balloon and you rub it against your jumper, you can make the balloon stick to the ceiling, all those kinds of things. Static electricity. The Van de Graaff generator works from exactly this phenomenon. Uh, its more technical name, name is it's called the triboelectric effect but uh, it's basically static electricity so if you have a van de graaff generator what it's inside look like is you've got just basically a belt continually traveling around and this belt is rubbing against this upper roller and creating static electricity and that basically separates charge out so you've got the thing going around you end up charging the belt negatively and then the uh, the roller positively the belt then carries on and carries the negative charge away, which leaves the positive charge here. Then you can see there's this little kind of comb 
here. And the reason why you've got these sort of very uh, fine teeth here is that the interaction of the positive charges here and these very fine teeth creates a very strong electric field in this, this region. Um, so very strong kind of electric forces just due to the very point-like nature of this, this comb, which actually is sufficiently strong to make the air break down and so that current can start to flow. So they're kind of mini sparks, it's kind of a current flows. And so this positive charge can then redistribute itself around the outside of the Van de Graaff generator. And because you've got this thing continuously running, this process just goes on and on and on. So you add more and more positive charge to the outside um, and the negative gets carried away down to earth and then you can use, you know, use that to uh, charge negatively a separate, a separate conductor over here. The only tricky bit about that is, and the bit I kind of skated over in there is I said, oh, it's all just static electricity. It turns out the process by which rubbing two things together, in this case, this belt and roller, lead to charge separation is really poorly understood. When you rub two things together, depending on which materials you pick, one of them will charge positively and the other will charge negatively. And so, and there are, uh, are kind of rules as to which materials you should pick to charge positively and negatively. It, one of the perversities of this and one of the reasons why we don't understand it as well as we'd like to is that actually it turns out we think, you know, you, so you produce this set of rules that says rub these two together and I should get this. And once in a while you get the opposite of what you're expecting, which means that actually we don't understand things quite as well as we thought we did. One of the classic things that people use to produce electricity in this way actually is amber. Turns out if you rub amber um, with the then that's a very good way of producing static electricity. This was known back in ancient times because actually the word electron is actually the Greek word for amber. So actually the whole history of electricity and our understanding of things like electrons goes back to the ancient Greeks and doing these kind of static electricity experiments. Professor, what is it about the rubbing that creates the charge separation? So that's the bit that's really not understood. Firstly, it's not really friction. So you think, I'm rubbing two things together, I'm creating friction. The important part of that process of rubbing the two things together is effectively what you're doing is very, very many times per second bringing two surfaces together and pulling them apart again. So actually that process of rubbing things together is just a very effective way of, of bringing surfaces together and pulling them apart. And it's that process of bringing things together and pulling them apart that produces this static electricity effect. So probably what happens is there's a process when you bring two different materials together, there's a process called adhesion, which is that they start trying to stick together. And again, there are lots of ways that adhesion can happen. It can happen through chemical bonds starting to happen between two different materials. It can happen just because the surfaces kind of lock together. And so what happens is you put, bring these two surfaces together, they start to stick. Then when you pull them apart, you leave something behind. And so for example, you might imagine you bring these two surfaces together, they start to stick. So an electron maybe becomes shared between the two surfaces a bit, which creates the beginnings of a chemical bond. Then you rip them apart again and maybe systematically the electrons get left behind. And so you can see that, that the net effect of that is every time you do it, on average, you're moving an electron from here to here, leaving this thing positively charged and this thing negatively charged. And because this rubbing process is a very effective way of doing that many, many times per second, it that's a, then becomes a quite an efficient way of transferring charge between the two. But to give you an idea of the level of uncertainty in this process, there is even still, so I was reading some of the recent scientific literature on this subject. People are still writing papers about this and there is even still a lot of debate about whether the thing that transfers from one to the other is always an electron or actually sometimes whether it's a positively charged. So you can think if you've got a, a, an atom you can think of it as an electron and the kind of positively charged remnants uh, which might have other electrons still around it but a thing called an ion, positively charged thing. People are still arguing about whether this process transfers ions across or whether it transfers electrons across which kind of gives you an indication of the fundamental lack of understanding. What you have in a thundercloud is the air in a thundercloud is very unstable. You get very strong updrafts. So you have air being kind of sucked up to the tops of these things. The reason why they have this characteristic shape to them is the air gets kind of sucked up and then spreads out as it reaches the top. Within these clouds, they're typically quite a long way below freezing, so you have ice. And in fact, the ice comes in two sort of flavors. There are little ice crystals and there are big sort of hail, wet hail things, which they have a technical name, they're called graupel. The graupel are these kind of big wet hailstones and you've got these little ice crystals. Because the little ice crystals are much lighter, the updrafts just lift them up. Whereas the graupel, because it's heavier, is, is able to resist that upward force and actually just falls under gravity. So you've got these little ice crystals going up and there's wet hailstones falling down. And of course they collide with one another. That transfers positive charge from the hailstones to the ice crystals. 
the little ice crystal then continue to rise up, taking the positive charge with them, and end up charging the top of that cloud with positive charge. The hailstones continue to fall, taking the negative charge down with them, and creating the negative charge at the bottom. So that's how you get this charge separation. And because there are an awful lot of these little uh, collisions going on all the time, although each one only transfers a tiny amount of charge, just as with the Van de Graaff generator, the net effect of all those collisions going on is to transfer a huge amount of charge so you can create an enormous potential difference between the top of the cloud and the bottom of the cloud, enough to actually create sparks. So are you saying most lightning is just transferring from one side of the cloud to the other? Because when I think of lightning, I think of electricity going from a cloud down to the ground. So that's when life gets really complicated. So there's a potential difference between the bottom of the cloud now, which is quite strongly negatively charged, and the ground, which actually is positively charged. So there are- Why is the ground positively charged? That's again, another very good question. And it's again, something which is sort of a slightly open question as to whether it is, if you go away from a thundercloud and ask whether, you know, whether the ground is positive relative to the air higher up, it turns out that it is. Um, and so something again is continually charging the earth up or removing charge from the Earth again, and it's probably again some quite subtle static electricity effect. Are you telling me that the Earth is positively charged? It is, there's a huge voltage between the Earth and the top of your head, yeah, <laughs> it turns out. I also had no idea that charge in clouds was caused by ice smashing into each other. It, it, uh, and I think the other thing to emphasise is that that's the best theory. And people have done lab experiments to show that indeed you can, if you charge, crash these little ice crystals, it's quite a hard thing to do in a lab, but if you crash little ice crystals into these bigger wet hailstones, you do create charge transfer. So we know the effect, the phenomenon does work. Whether it's really what's driving everything that's going on in thunderstorms isn't clear. And then the whole question about, well, how does the thing discharge and there's a whole kind of phenomenology of what goes on. You can have lightning between one cloud and another, lightning within a cloud, lightning from, from cloud to ground. Sometimes lightning goes downwards. Sometimes it's a thing called the leader when it's going downwards. Sometimes you see the flash going back upwards with high speed photography. So there's a very complicated lot of physics that's going on, but the underlying mechanism behind it is this charge separation and almost certainly the underlying mechanism between that charge separation or is this triboelectric effect which causes these enormous static charges within clouds. In terms of what about what triggers the lightning, like you've got these huge charges building up, is there like a critical mass or a magic number, or like what makes the lightning think, all right, enough's enough, I'm, I'm, I'm doing it. And again, it's complicated and it looks like the story is not that well understood. If you do the, the kind of the naive calculation, you find that actually there isn't enough voltage there to trigger the lightning strike. So then the question is, well, what is it? We see lightning strikes. And so there are some pretty extreme theories which are actually quite credible. Like it could be that a high energy cosmic ray from space has crashed into the cloud, created a, a kind of a shower of charge, and that's enough to kind of create the ionization which just kicks the thing off. But what it is exactly really, again, really isn't that well understood why it is that lightning triggers at one moment and not another moment. That's crazy. <laughs> Typical astronomer. Well, it's all down to astronomy, really, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> I've never even heard that theory. That's amazing. You never heard that, yeah. But that, is that one of the fringe theories? I don't think so. I, that's the trouble. I've been really struggling to find, you know, usually there's one narrative that I can use for a video like this that says most people think it's this way. Right? It really is still quite complicated and messy. And although we sort of understand quite a lot of the underlying basic physics, how it all gets put together in detail and what, some, what all the elements are still isn't clear. And Wikipedia hasn't got the answer. Even Wikipedia doesn't have the answer.